Danny Snodgrass grew up in a bad area of northern Jacksonville, Florida. Growing up poverty-stricken and without a dad made things hard for him and his mom. They grew up relying on his mother's Starbucks barista checks to get by, not leaving much for anything else. His mother remarried and his stepdad played drummer in a band. When the band would take smoke breaks, Danny would sneak in the room and mess with the instruments, sparking his initial interest in music, teaching himself music theory and how to play guitar at an extremely young age. He listened to a lot of rock music like Kiss and Motley Crue, but as he got older, the kids in school and the area he was in would inevitably get him listening to rap. He always knew school wasn't for him, and this caused motivational issues. It led to him failing 7th grade three times. Not because he couldn't do it, but because simply he didn't care. Surprisingly, his mother was supportive of him dropping out of school. Maybe she saw something in him nobody else did. His mom and stepdad always wanted him to do music and play in a band, but he felt like that was something that made them happy and not him. Danny spent most of his days on the internet just messing around on blogs and forums, eventually getting into graphic design. Feeling ambitious and confident, he would tell his family how he could make so much money doing designs for people, and they would joke with him telling him he's never going to make a penny online. Unfortunately, years would go by and not much change, still unable to make any money. He was turning 17 now and was really starting to feel the pressure. His mother was diagnosed with cancer and was still trying to work her Starbucks job. Watching his mom go through this made him want to go harder. He needed to make some money somehow. A friend would tell him to check out FL Studio for making beats. Jumping on the chance that this might make him some money, he did. He started making beats every day and didn't wait to sell them either. Admittedly, he says his beats were trash at first, but local people would buy them still because they knew his situation. This would give him a small bit of hope he needed just to keep going. He decided to go with the producer named Taz Taylor. For the next couple years, Taz would spend all his time building his online presence, leveraging social medias like Twitter and YouTube. He would then turn these followers into buying customers for his beats. This would end up building him a solid following of people. Seeing the potential in online marketing of beats, he would pawn some of his possessions just to build an in-home studio so he could go harder. He began asking rappers for their emails, building up a contact list. He would use those emails to send beats and attach a PayPal link for anyone interested in buying them. Within a short period of time, he said he earned almost $10,000 for his mom's cancer treatment. Taz wasn't just learning to sell beats online though. He was getting his feet wet in the world of marketing and business strategy, something that he took a lot of interest in, arguably more than the beats. He wanted to learn the ins and outs of every side of the music industry. He would be part of the early wave of tight beat producers online. Over the years, he worked up to being able to make $500 a day just by kicking back while people passively bought beats. Meanwhile this is going on, Nicholas Muir is growing up in the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia. Much like Taz, he grew up listening to mostly rock and playing guitar as early as 5 years old. Music played a huge role in his life. He spent most of his time playing various instruments including the piano, or simply just listening to music. But at a certain point he lost his passion for it all. He went through a weird period of time where he just didn't feel like playing his guitar or piano anymore. It wasn't until around 12 years old he started to listen to hip hop and rap and all that guitar and piano influence would transcend into making beats. Initially his cousin had a keyboard from Radio Shack that had a bunch of drum loops on it. He would mess around with it a lot, eventually leading him to do his own research on how he could make his own beats. He would go on to teach himself music production, learning as he went, but even at a young age he was already asking himself, how can I make money off this, and how can I make this a career? Day in and day out he dedicated himself into learning something new and sticking to it. One thing he always did even early on was incorporate live instruments in his beats, giving his beats a unique sound and edge to them. As he got a little older and more confident in his beats, he began uploading tight beats to YouTube, as well as building friendships with other YouTube producers. This is how he discovered MJ Nichols, another YouTube producer. He used to live stream making beats, and he was also online friends with Taz Taylor. Nick would go into MJ Nichols and Taz Taylor's streams to ask questions and talk to other producers in the chat. This is how he would meet another producer who had a huge impact on his career. That producer was Sidepiece. The live streams and chatting became a regular thing and inevitably they would all become familiar with each other's names and slowly started to build friendships. They wouldn't just be producer friends though, they would play PlayStation together and talk about their personal lives as well. This went on for a while and they really bonded. In 2014, Taz Taylor was being trolled by a rapper he was working with. He kept joking with him about how much money he made online, saying we're gonna call you internet money. He would tweet out the statement, we're getting internet money, and other producers and people would use the slogan as well. Seeing the positive response from everyone online, 
he decided to change his Twitter name to Internet Money before someone else took it. This would give him the initial idea to get other producer friends involved and push the Internet Money as a collective group. After pitching the idea to Nick and the guys online, they agreed it was a good idea. From there forward, they would not only rep themselves, but their brand Internet Money too. Taz being the oldest and most experienced one in the group, he would be like a big brother to Nick and the other guys, teaching them how to market and sell beats online so they could start making some money too. In early 2015, Taz would get one of his first beat placements with widely successful Trey songs. Somebody close to Trey would show him Taz beat from YouTube. At first they told him that the song was going to be on the upcoming album, but later broke the news that it didn't make the cut. Although the song was not crazy successful, it would give Taz a competitive edge being able to tell people he's worked with such a big artist. But he felt slightly discouraged. He honestly didn't like how business side of things went with Trey's songs, and he wanted to keep selling his beats online, not really caring for the huge placements. Later in the year he got into an online argument with record producer Ninth Wonder, who was bad mouthing tight beat producers. The online debacle would bring some attention to Taz, that helped him gain more followers. In 2016, with the success of his online beat store, he decided to try to recruit a manager to try and help further his career. He linked up with his new manager Bird, who was associated with Brick Squad Monopoly, and had a lot of connections in the industry. Bird told Taz that he liked what he was doing with the internet money idea, but he felt like he could go even bigger with it. The very next day after talking with Bird, Taz's life would change. He woke up to a call from Steven Victor, who was Designer's manager at the time. Designer being one of the biggest new artists out of 2016, this was huge. Steven asked Taz if he had sent beats to Designer, because he was hopping on a beat of his. Taz replied, no, I've never sent him anything, he must have taken it off my YouTube page. The fact that two of his first placements with major artists both came from his YouTube showed just how effective the tight beats were. The song would feature Big Sean on it as well, but after some drama the label decided to put Gucci Mane on the song instead. This gave him a big boost of clout that once again he could leverage to hype up his internet money brand. The whole team continued to work, with Taz leading the way. In 2017, Nick Mira and Taz Taylor would get their first collab placed. This song was Fuck Love by Trippy Red and XXX. Initially X didn't like the beat, but after hearing what Trippy Red did to it, he hopped on the song and decided to place it on his album titled 17. This obviously being another huge win for Taz, and the first huge win for Nick. The song entered the top 100 at number 41, and eventually peaked at number 28 after the unfortunate passing of X. The song later became the most played SoundCloud song ever with over 250 million plays. Meanwhile this is going on, Nick Mirror's close friend Sidepiece had just discovered music from a rapper in Chicago. He only had a couple hundred followers on SoundCloud. He went by the name Juice the Kid, but later changed it to Juice World. And Nick and Sidepiece really liked his music. Although he didn't have a huge following, neither did they, and they were just making music because they loved it. Nick and Sidepiece continued to send beats over the coming months. They ended up recording over 30 songs with Juice World. One of the earliest songs they did was Lucid Dreams, which dropped on his Juice World 999 EP in 2017. But the song didn't blow up yet. It wasn't until Juice began to gain more traction for his music almost six months later, when blog sites like Lyrical Lemonade would cover his three song EP, Nothing's Different. The EP included the song All Girls Are The Same. Shortly after, getting a music video from the iconic Cole Bennett, the song went viral, and quickly followed by the re-release of Lucid Dreams, this time with the music video by Cole as well. The songs and Juice World's career would blow up. Along with it, Nick Mira. They would go down as some of the highest streaming songs of 2018. Nick, who had quickly become the biggest talked about producer, would continue to hold down his affiliation with internet money. He could have easily gone off and done his own thing, but his bond with Taz, Sidepiece, and all the other members of internet money went deeper. He wanted to continue to build up the brand with his friends that he started with. Taz continued to recruit new producers and artists, always putting the brand before his own personal name. But he too produced huge records of his own. The group would grow to over 10 members, each bringing their own unique contributions, even gaining them their own internet money label. From 2019 to present, Taz has been responsible for the findings and breakthrough of multiple superstars such as Lil Tecca and Ian Dior. There's no denying the fact that Taz has an ear for good music. He's the backbone of internet money, and he takes pride in how he looks out for his producers and artists, taking the big brother and manager role for the people he believes in. Nick Mira has gone on to be one, if not the most influential producer of the last five years. To list his production credits would be silly, there's no excuse for not knowing who he is. All of this started with a group of friends who met online and shared a passion for music. They changed the game for all type B and online producers everywhere, showing us that nothing is impossible. But it wasn't easy. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this content, consider liking and subscribing for more.